yeah. Oops, recording. Got it. Um, yeah, that was. Uh, I'm sorry. I used the British term there, seconded. That's what they. Uh, but actually, I think we call it in NOAA anyway. We used to call it a, a detail. So I was loaned by the U.S. government to the IWC, um, and then when that ran out, they offered me a position there, at least a part a part time petition. Uh, position to keep continue doing what I was doing. But um, you might some of you may be surprised that the International Whaling Commission uh, is has anything to do with anything other than whaling, but its mandate is to um, to manage as well uh, the the um, the populations. And so really they deal with any um, anything anything that humans do that that could uh, remove a whale from the population. They have to. The, they have a scientific committee that has to understand uh, how many animals are being removed, whether it's by whaling or any other human activity. Uh, so there are several uh, parts of the IWC. Um, by the way, there are 88 member countries, and they are made up. Uh, the the management and political. Uh, the main commission is a commission, um, but they have a scientific committee, a conservation committee. Uh, and some other subcommittees. And the scientific committee has been looking at bycatch uh, for decades now, um, but with a increased interest since 2006, which I'll explain. And then the other commission uh, committees um, like the conservation committee, but also they have a, a co committee or a subcommittee on uh, whale killing methods and associated welfare issues. But if you're interested in, any, in dive, taking a deep dive into that, they're, they're, the IWC has a website right there and I'll, I'll uh, maybe circulate some of the links I have in here to Gary uh, later on or at the end. But uh, starting in, in 2011, um, they began the Large Whale Initiative, which I've been heading up since its inception. Um, but with the success of that, they also have a specifically a, by, a bycatch mitigation initiative with a coordinator and expert panel. panel and, they, whoops, and they also have a, a stranding initiative. And um, the reason, reason for the stranding is that's often how uh, uh, folks in, um, especially in developing countries, sometimes the only thing, they, they don't have uh, resources for shipboard surveys or that kind of thing. So sometimes the only um, uh, window into the health of their populations is by what washes up on the beaches. And with regard to um, entanglement and bycatch, I think you know, along the US coast, the Atlantic coast, there was a, a really um, intensive summary done of this uh, back in, uh, uh, well, published in 2013 by Vanderhoop and all. They looked at the records uh, between 1970 and 2009 from data, uh, stranded animals along the coast. And indeed they found there was evidence uh, of 67% were diagnosed as mortalities related to, or with signs of human interaction and entanglement uh, was identified as the leading uh, cause of death for large whales. Um, there's been an attempt to look at that more globally. Um, you know, I, if you've read this, you, you know that this is, it's important work because it was the first attempt to do it. It is pretty, um, by, by its, its nature, it has to be a, a, a pretty, more like a guesstimate of what's going on. There's a, 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 a wide variability, but the estimate by that, the 2006 publication by I read it all was that over 300,000 cetaceans die annually uh, in uh, bycatch and, gill and entanglement. And uh, you can see th approximately 345,000 pinna uh, 45, pinnipeds. Now they recognized that that this was an underestimate for large whales, uh, because quite frequently this was done uh, by extrapolating from observers, fisheries observers, and quite frequently large whales take the gear and and uh, drag it elsewhere, and so it's not it's just comes up as missing. They, the the um, the observers and the fisher fishers don't know uh, what what got it. Uh, so over the last couple of decades. Uh, trying to get an idea, um, a better idea of, of the rate of encounter of uh, whales and, and uh, man-made materials of rope and net and whatnot. Um, that was uh, pioneered by the work at the New England Aquarium with uh, North Atlantic right whales, where they now, I think the estimate is approximately 83% of the population show at least some um, evidence of encountering rope or net uh, in, the, in the water column. So 
that um, at that time that was that was a kind of shocking to everybody uh, when that came out and uh, we realized well they gee they are interacting um, much more frequently than people thought with with um, uh, fishing gear um, I'm going to focus a little more on, on humpback whales because that's work that's been done here at the Center for Coastal Studies, but also it um, it's, uh, gives us a window into the rest of the world to some degree. And what was done here by um, Dr. Duke Robbins was to take uh, systematic photographs of the tail stock of, a, of, a humpback, of humpback whales and look for these uh, estimates of, or these um, evidence of characteristic wounds and scarring. Uh, and um, uh, in, in doing that, these are some, some of the results. Uh, more than 50% of the Gulf of Maine humpback population have um, scarring. And I think she, her, her um, criteria is a little more conservative than the right whale, the New England Aquarium. Uh, so it's, uh, they're probably closer than, than one uh, that they might look in terms of the, the, the level in the population. But one of the kind of scaring the things was uh, because it's a well-monitored population, um, up anywhere from 10 to 25% of the population got new wounds each year. So it wasn't a situation where whales were learning and avoiding, or it looked like this was something that just was a, uh, an issue for them every year. And because the center runs the response network here, um, where most of the Gulf of Maine humpback whales are, they were able to look at who was being who was seen entangled and who was being reported and who and who had new wounds and were able to estimate that only 10 percent of uh, entangled humpback whales are, are reported to the network and using that and um, some of the fisheries uh, uh, survival data uh, estimated about a three percent annual mortality due to entang entanglement so this this was also kind of shocking because uh, for an, a, a species that can only um, at maximum reproduce at about 10% a year. That's a significant um, hit. So um, when I was in uh, Hawaii as the research coordinator of um, uh, the humpback whale sanctuary there, um, I got together a bunch of the researchers in there in, in the Pacific. Uh, we all got together and decided to do um, an ocean-based study like we had done in the Atlantic. But in, this time we would also try to take uh, photographs of, um, uh, of tail stocks to get a sense of their uh, the rates of entanglement uh, or interaction with gear around the whole North Pacific Basin. These pies are, are basically the size of the pie. The pies are um, the sample size of good photographs. Uh, the portion of the pie that's black is you the percentage you that she, whoops, uh, had the um, uh, portion <laughs> sure. of the population that's um, uh, entangled in the gray is is those that didn't show evidence of that but but there was basically this was again was an eye opener because it showed there there wasn't any population that was immune to the um, uh, interaction and, and entanglement from with ropes and net. By the way, it's important to remember that the scarring only tells you about who survived, um, so you have to be careful in the interpretation. So when when did this uh, entanglement issue begin for large whales? Um, I, at least, uh, I, I'm not a historian, and, but when I was looking into it briefly, the, the earliest record I could find was um, Japanese whaling uh, began to use nets in 1675. And so that was probably a result of them having, um, uh, ac you know, accidentally have whales in their nets and realized that, okay, well, if they wanted to catch them, that was one way to do it. And that's the, some of the, the old um, paintings that, that show that process. Uh, today, one of the greater uh, threats for, the, for whales on the Japanese coast, anyway, are what they call set nets. But I think we also, in this area, we might know them as um, pound nets or um, uh, cod traps or uh, herring weirs, that, that kind of permanent structure. And um, uh, the, these are uh, much very similar to what um, up in Newfoundland was, uh, is called a cod trap. And the reason I mentioned this is because um, I think Newfoundland is where we sort of first realized that in entanglement of large whales was, was, could be a very big issue. When the Capelin moved inshore back in the 70s uh, and 80s, the, um, the whales moved inshore and there were these types of cod traps all along the coast. And basically you can see that the uh, numbers of entanglements, this is um, data collected 
by uh, John Lean originally um, at Memorial University. They got to uh, one, one summer in 1991 where over 140 uh, whales were uh, reported in these um, entangled in this area. Um, that, however, what went down immediately with the cod moratorium, and you can see after the cod moratorium, the numbers had decreased. It was mostly uh, humpback whales, but uh, there were some um, uh, minkies as well, and occasional fin whales. And I put this in, just you might find it, maybe uh, there's a paper out on this, and, and um, uh, but you might find it interesting that uh, it showed the types of gear, and you see, uh, obviously, a, mo a lot of it was in the, the fish traps, although a lot of in the gill nets as well. But with the moratorium, a lot of the inshore gill nets and the, the fish traps uh, were no longer in use, and um, you start to see a more diversity in the terms of the types of gear that uh, whales get entangled in. And uh, actually, the local uh, responder up there feels that a, a lot of the entanglement issue has kind of moved offshore, where because a lot of the fishermen moved offshore. Uh, and moved into the snow crab fishery. But that had an impact uh, uh, not only on the whales, but on the, uh, the fisher fishermen themselves. And that was why um, uh, John Lean was very successful working with the fishermen because he'd help get these live whales out of the gear um, with, uh, with the least uh, damage uh, to the gear so they could get back to fishing. Uh, and that really was the, the first, that, that I'm aware of, the first organized uh, response to entangled whales um, uh, uh, that I know of. Um, a couple of years later at the Center for Coastal Studies, we developed uh, 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 techniques for disentangling free swimming whales. And, and, uh, but I'll get into that in, uh, in a little bit. Uh, but it not only has impact to you know, industrial fishing or develop, fishing in developed countries, but through the work I've been doing over the last few years, I've realized um, in talking with the fishermen, this can have a, a, a really devastating impact to some of the artisanal uh, fisheries. Uh, for instance, in Brazil, they, after the training we did there, they did a interview a questionnaire with fishermen and in the, in the area where the humpbacks breed and they found um, that nearly 40% of the fishermen ha reported having at least one entanglement, um, mostly in the gill nets. And, um, but one fisherman uh, uh, in one season had reported f five different entanglements in his gear. And the season wasn't even over at that point. So it's a, a very high, in some parts of the world, it's, it's very, um, very high incidence. Uh, also, when I did a training in Peru, the, the fishermen had actually requested the training because um, along with a, um, a, a nonprofit and a university and the government, uh, because they were losing gear to uh, whales. Um, in their gillnet fishery, there are about 8,000 fishers, and they, the fishermen, estimated that each one of them may lose their gear every other year to a whale entanglement, which is a significant hit to them. And we we roughed out a back, you know, back of the envelope calculation of about three million dollars a year. Whoops, I'm missing a zero there. I see. Um, and then also, I was asked to do a training in in Greenland because uh, they were starting to get humpbacks moving in. Uh, into coastal trap nets, the nets very similar to the um, uh, the Newfoundland cod traps. They don't have as big a population, and that I don't know where that uh, that stands now. But they we did some training up there. But we also realized that not only does this have an impact on the fisheries, uh, but it has it's a, there's a safety concern. This is a, a fisherman off of Iceland uh, trying to free a humpback whale, and you'll see in a moment he almost gets whacked by the tail. He's trying to use a, a handheld small knife to get the whale out. And um, I think he's very fortunate he didn't get hurt there. But um, uh, so this is just, you know, this could be from almost anywhere around the world, uh, whale getting uh, entangled in, in uh, pots and gill nets, mostly passive gear. But what brought it actually to the attention of the of the, ID, of the International Whaling Commission, or what raised its profile a bit, was that in 2006, um, uh, several countries expressed concerns about the, uh, the welfare indications uh, or, or um, uh, of, uh, of entanglements. And because there is a subcommittee looking at the welfare of, of whaling, uh, they were also looking at other welfare issues like uh, how to handle strandings and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, to give you an idea, this looks like a, a very simple entanglement. Uh, you're looking at the back end of a humpback whale with rope 
uh, a couple wraps around the tail stock and the tail. Uh, and, uh, you know, we were able to get this off, but if we hadn't, it could turn into this. Uh, this is um, a live humpback whale trying to dive with totally deteriorated um, and necrotic uh, uh, fluke, uh, tail flukes. Uh, you can actually almost see the bone, the, the, uh, the vertebrae there. But so the paper came out in 2006 about uh, the time to death of, um, of entangled right whales uh, if, if there wasn't an inter intervention. And, you know, it turned out to be average time to death was six months. Well, at the International Whaling Commission, they were looking at the time to death for, the, uh, for whaling in, in terms of seconds and minutes, maybe hours. But um, so this was uh, obviously a, a serious concern for uh, uh, welfare concern. So the, um, the IWC, I uh, helped them convene a workshop in Hawaii where I was at the time. And we had participants, uh, actually some of you remember, may remember Ed Lyman standing right down there in the front and a couple of folks from the Center for Coastal Studies, but people from around the world to try to look at this in a, in a, um, a bigger context. Uh, uh, what do we know about the extent of this and the scope of it and what are different countries trying to do? What, are the, what do we understand about it and that kind of thing. And um, pretty quickly we realized, okay, the, these entanglements are being reported all over the world. Um, and in fact, the IWC uh, d does get national progress reports from countries that are supposed to list uh, entanglements. Um, it's pretty spotty, frankly, the, the, for everything in the national pro uh, progress reports. But I was able to get six years of consistent reports from these, this, uh, these countries here. And what we saw from that is that um, all large whale species were reported uh, entangled. So there were reports of everything from, um, and this is back in 2010, we looked at this. And as far as where and when it happened, pretty much um, uh, anywhere there, was, there, was, there were whales and, and passive gear, it looks like, mostly gear that's anchored or drifting without any, making any noise. And, and so looking at the gear, um, Basically, this is also from the same uh, National Progress Reports. The, on the top axis here, the, um, this is the uh, FAO gear type. Um, and I'm sure everybody has those memorized, but if you don't, basically uh, the, and it, these Gs are gill nets, ground and, and drift, and uh, the, these are pots. So the main, uh, most of the, um, uh, the entanglements reported from these, from the, these countries that did in the IWC were um, in gill nets and fish pots. Also in, in Asia, you know, they were in the set nets um, that I showed you a, an image of. So we were starting to get a, but you can see there also, this is long lines. So there are reports in long lines and, and other types of gear. Um, so actually, if you're interested in this, this workshop report, it's available uh, along with three subsequent workshops uh, at, at the IWC website. But we agreed that the issue occurs wherever whales and passive gear overlap, uh, agreed that it was often severely underestimated, and agreed at that time that it was both a welfare and a conservation issue. We now know it's also a socioeconomic and safety issue. Um, and uh, there were primary recommendations was prevention. Uh, but knowing that that was not going to happen anytime soon, um, there was a, um, a strong recommendation for capacity building and data collection to understand it better. Um, so again, uh, the, the entanglements happen wherever whales and gear overlap, uh, although that's where they happen, but where they're reported is a, is a different thing. Uh, so when I was out in Hawaii with Ed setting up the network there, um, we found that uh, at, at, in the beginning, almost uh, over half of our entanglement reports were carrying gear that they dragged down from Alaska. So obviously I, I, um, you have to be careful. There's a tendency people have to go, Oh, the whale was reported entangled off of off of Massachusetts, so it must have been uh, it must have been entangled there. But actually, most of them are dragging the gear around, and you have to really look into it to understand uh, where it originally encountered the gear. So this this was the uh, just to give at that time a breakdown. Uh, a lot of it is just unknown rope, uh, but you can see 25% were pots. Uh, mostly those were from from Alaska, etc. 
And you can, some people do ask, well, what, what percent of this problem is um, debris? And in, in, it's hard to know because all of this unknown, um, you know, could be a certain percentage of that could be, could be debris. Uh, but of what we were able to determine only about, in Hawaii, anywhere from five to 10% of, the, of what, what we took off at, um, was, uh, we were able to be pretty sure was um, debris or abandoned, lost or discarded fishing gear. And so people do ask, well, is there any place where this is an issue? And actually, um, this is, I mentioned uh, while we were chatting beforehand that I just gave, or uh, actually a year ago, I gave a talk to the Alaska, uh, no, sorry, last summer, Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission about the issue of um, entangled bowhead whales. Um, and they realized that they do have um, uh, scarring and some of them have actually come up with gear on them. But it turns out that uh, bowheads um, don't overlap with fishing gear when it's when it's actually being fished, because the bowheads stay right on the ice edge, the edge of the ice, and the fishermen try to stay away from the ice, but they lose their gear to the ice. And so we think this may be one place in the world where a significant portion of the entanglement issue is um, in uh, abandoned, lost, or discarded fishing gear. And um, these. Uh, show you where the fishery, fishing is and the whales and whatnot, but they, uh, they basically overlap. Uh, they do not overlap in time. They overlap in, in uh, space, depending on the, where the ice is. Uh, also, there's a big giant unknown out there in the, in the pelagic, the international waters. Um, this is just a heat map that shows um, fishing effort throughout the um, uh, international waters. And, um, we, it's mostly uh, seining and longlining. And we do know that there's been a real increase in the use of fish aggregating devices. And we're now starting to get reports of entangled animals uh, in uh, fish aggregating devices. And really those are, are, are very much like, in fact, some of them, uh, the sort of artisanal ones are made out of debris, uh, but um, even the professional ones with the sonar and the, and the, the uh, uh, telemetry are uh, drifting around like like debris out there. So how do they become entangled? Well, we do know that whales are curious about objects in the in their environment from um, uh, playing with a porpoise here or lip, uh, getting in under some kelp and and balancing it on their head. But they'll also do that with man-made objects. Off, this is off Massachusetts and this is off Hawaii where a whale was uh, investigating a clump of rope and a little piece of net. So that's one way, but the other way is, is probably the more insidious is when they're feeding um, because then often the, the rope or, or the materials could get in the baleen and that makes it extremely hard for the whale to shed it and hard for responders to release it. And uh, here's a, uh, I, some of you have probably seen this, but this was a humpback whale on Stellwagen Bank that um, uh, basically was feeding around uh, tuna boats that were anchored, small tuna boats, and it clamped, clamped down on, a, uh, on the anchor line of one of the boats. And this is a, sort of within minutes of it having become entangled. Uh, you can see the, the first, and this seems to be the case for all of them, or for many of the big ones, the first reaction is to uh, panic a bit, thrash and kick and try to get it off of them. Unfortunately, this usually makes the entanglement worse. Um, there are some whales like the minke whale that may just stop out of a kind of a shock, but uh, it is, we don't you know, fully understand. You don't see this happen all that often. Um, but to get some sense of, um, uh, of where, uh, the, the, one of the best data sets that I've, uh, uh, come across was the uh, data worked up by uh, the Korean scientists on the minke whale entanglements uh, off their coast. Uh, you can see there this, the set net again, those are the trap type nets, pots and gill nets. And you can see they were able to break down how many were in the mouth, how many on the tail, how many just the body and how many on the mouth and the tail. And the, the majority um, were in the mouth, you can see, but um, uh, still, uh, usually if it gets in the mouth, it's probably going to in, in evolve, um, involve the tail as well as the whale moves forward. Uh, oh, one interesting 
the, you, this bit of in the net, um, I believe that this, all, most of their set nets that I saw when I was visiting there are have um, nets across the top to keep the birds from diving in to get the fish. And uh, we know that um, many whales and minke whales in particular are, are really adverse to coming up and pushing up on, a, on an object like a net. And so many of them are just swimming around in the, um, uh, the set net until they drown. They won't come up and, and push up the net. Uh, so we can, uh, how can it kill them? I think most of you are familiar with this. It, they, uh, they can drown, they can starve if it's such a drag that they can't feed or uh, uh, it's such an energy cost, or it can create a chronic infection where they develop sepsis and die, or it can even cut through their body uh, or cut or amp amputate a body part. This, um, We've talked a little bit about the impact of fisheries, but it also obviously has an impact on the recovery of some very small populations. Everybody here is familiar with the North Atlantic right whale, but there's also the North Pacific uh, right whale uh, that uh, shows evidence of entanglement. And here's an entanglement off Korea. Uh, the Southeast Pacific right whale off of Chile is, um, is considered a very small population, endangered population. And the um, humpback whale in the Arabian Sea, I don't know if you know, is, is a non-migratory population that's genetically distinct from the rest of the humpback whales of the world. And is, um, the estimate is, pro is probably fewer than 200 of them left in the Arabian Sea. So there's a paper uh, uh, out on this if you're interested, but um, uh, basically it's mostly um, right whale pop populations, um, the Western gray whale, which may not, may no longer exist, uh, or they may have merged with the Eastern Pacific. Um, Sivakosk bowheads uh, and um, uh, small populations of humpbacks like Oman, uh, the Arabian Sea, and also the Central American uh, population. And then um, there's some certain populations of Brutus whale, including the one found, recently found in the Gulf of Mexico, which is different enough that it's now considered a, a separate whale, a rice, rice's whale but these are some of the most. So uh, at the because the countries were requesting capacity building, we held a second workshop uh, here in Provincetown uh, with uh, heads of all the, all the existing networks around the world. We agreed to uh, best practices or principles and guidelines, agreed to a capacity building curricula and uh, formally uh, developed an expert panel to advise. Uh, the, the principles and guidelines are, um, First and foremost, human safety. Uh, the training specifies or is very specific about that, and and uh, um, but it also uh, uh, takes into consideration animal welfare. And this is probably one that's you know most important to your management interests is that it should contribute to prevention by gathering standardized data, so we understand it better. Uh, also, it should help raise public awareness, but it always, always must be done with the authorization or the agreement of uh, the relevant government agency. Uh, so the curriculum basically has a background on issues, discussion of local events, uh, help components of a response and a network. And then we go into the disentanglement tools and techniques, stressing safety and documentation. And uh, this, uh, uh, the background and the documentation, again, is we've, there's a strong component that is, you know, I, I, I tell the trainees right up front, I said, look, you're, I know you're all here to learn how to untangle a whale, but what this is not the answer. What you really need to do uh, is, is figure out how to prevent this. That's best for the fishermen and best for the whales. Uh, I, don't, I won't go into that right now because uh, I think I'm going a little, <laughs> running a little over. But the, the capacity building is um, uh, is two days. First day in the classroom and on land, getting familiar with the uh, the techniques, and then the second day is at sea and in two small boats, uh, getting practice, uh, throwing ropes, uh, putting on buoys, the, and the, and some practical exercises. So now, since 2012. Um, the IWC has been partnered with the Center for Coastal Studies to, to in this capacity building uh, initiative. And we've uh, trained um, about 1300 trainees from uh, more than 34 countries. 
including some that, that you might be surprised uh, or they may surprise you, but uh, actually Norway and Greenland and Japan have all had uh, trainings. The, the training in Japan was not for the, the, the country, it was for the, um, the offshore uh, survey vessel that, uh, so if they found, they had found occasionally entangled whales offshore and they uh, asked for the training to, to have a better idea what to do. Uh, also, uh, I mentioned the humpback whales in the, sea, the Arabian Sea. We did a training in Oman in 2015, and um, uh, a couple of years later, they were able to uh, disentangle uh, a humpback whale. Um, again, a very, very, very small population. So like North Atlantic right whales, each one you, you save is, is, is significant, has a significant positive impact. We also then, uh, after the training, we evaluate the trainees and working with the, the relevant government authority, uh, identify potential apprentices who can come back. Um, so far, they've all come, come here to the Center for Coastal Studies because the center has an apprenticeship program uh, pretty well developed and they can take part in research and, and uh, just get a, a much more, it's usually two to three weeks, they get a much more in-depth um, uh, view of uh, different case studies and, and potentially, they may help out with entanglement. For instance, this one, the, the whale entangled that we're working on, uh, the guy in front uh, is from Australia and went on to be the head of the Australian network. Uh, we also uh, developed a, um, uh, a panel of experts I mentioned um, from uh, around the world. Uh, I won't go into that into detail, except that we do uh, give advice when, when asked. Uh, in fact, just this morning, um, I, I was able to facilitate a conversation between Australia, Chile, Norway, and South Korea and the U.S. about whales becoming entangled in uh, aquaculture, specifically mussel uh, mussel farms. And um, uh, the guy uh, from Western Australia, they've had uh, several out there, so they he was able to help out. It was a request from South Africa. Uh, this is the uh, a sort of a map of where all the, the, the teams are. You can see we're kind of light in Africa. We're trying to work on that and Asia. But Latin America has been, uh, been very eager to get trained. And, um, uh, and this shows, these stars show the, the, uh, where the, the nodes in this network are. So as I, I always end the training by also saying prevention is the answer. And usually during this, we've given them um, a standardized data form that they can uh, adapt to collect um, uh, information safely while uh, releasing whales. And, um, and then we talk about ways that they may be able to um, uh, work with fisher, fishermen to um, come up with some ideas. In Mexico, they had a number of workshops with the local fishermen and came up with some ideas uh, based largely on what Ed did up in Alaska with the fishermen there. But <clears throat> but it was, um, you know, ideas for how they can help um, uh, prevent it, and if they get one, what to do, get, get a whale in their gear, what to do. But um, also in Brazil, in that area I mentioned with the questionnaire with, that says, has such a high rate, um, a number of the fishermen um, have uh, changed it voluntarily, changed their practices because they just were losing too much gear. Uh, some of them moved to longline gear, which is still a risk, but not as high a risk as the gillnets, and some of them have moved to fishing inside the reefs, uh, not out where the whales are uh, at the time of year they're, they're there, and some of them just stopped fishing during the whale season. <clears throat> also, there was a, I don't know how much it's really used, but I use this as an example of, of some of the ideas. This was sort of a, a fish trap that floats above, just above the surface uh, uh, that was meant to replace, I'm sorry, just above the bottom, uh, was meant to replace gill nets. And this was designed more to prevent um, um, seal predation, but it also helped prevent harbor porpoise bycatch. Uh, there are some folks working with um, uh, developing countries and that, that have few resources working on uh, low cost ideas, including uh, metal bolts hung up, hung in a, um, in a Coke bottle. Um, and that's, there have been some trials with that off some of the coast of Africa. They've also been using these fairly inexpensive lights that um, are, uh, you know, light, uh, turn on with, in the dark and flash. And there's been, there are some studies going on now in Peru with that. And I think they've been finding some success with that. Uh, they also in um, Pakistan and India, they've 
they've um, experimented with lowering the drift nets for tuna um, and found that they had a much lower rate of uh, small cetacean bycatch once the, they lowered it from the surface down to about, um, I think, 10 or 20 meters. And also, um, the last uh, training that I did before the pandemic was in uh, Ullapool, Scotland. And uh, it was at the request of the Scottish creel fishers who are, um, it's basically very, very similar to lobster. It's uh, lobster pots. It's a string of pots uh, with a buoy on each end. And, and um, they're a little smaller than our, our pots here, but um, they were extremely proactive about uh, wanting to have the training because they, um, they do uh, sell themselves as a clean fishery and they want to be. Um, and they, uh, there was evidence that was showing that 80, uh, well, they were beginning to get entanglements of minke whales and basking sharks and occasionally uh, humpback whales. And um, so afterwards we, um, uh, we sat down to debrief from the training and, and asked, well, you know, what do you guys think? And uh, what the first guy said, well, I think we should go back to sinking ground lines like we did, you know, before the synthetics. We, you know, he had actually used sinking, sinking ground lines and others were interested in um, using the remote release and, and the uh, uh, ropeless type uh, technology. And uh, so they're now, um, because uh, data's come in that shows that 80% of the whales and basking shark, sharks entangled in their gear is in the ground line. Um, there's a, um, they're going to be doing some trials with sinking ground line. And uh, if I would love if anybody on here has um, uh, any uh, advice or tidbits of uh, obstacles to avoid with the, um, the use of uh, sinking ground line here in, in Massachusetts, in New England, um, that would be great. Um, I think you can, I think my email is uh, available in the, uh, with the announcements that went out. Um, and I'd love to hear if they're hear from you if you have some advice on how to what not to do in terms of the uh, implementing sinking ground line. Um, but I think one of the guys out up there in Scotland has also went ahead and has started uh, uh, trying out some re remote release gear on on his own. Um, yeah, and I think you're familiar with this uh, the this type of desert star system that was is being used in parts of Australia. Um, but this is, I believe, is what the guy in uh, Scotland is, is, uh, is uh, uh, trying out. And uh, finally, I think, yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> um, some, uh, for, if you want further information, the IWC has uh, the, the website on entanglement and bycatch. Uh, the, our protocol, our principles and guidelines are, or best practices are available there in um, English, French, and Spanish. Um, the bycatch uh, initiative is described with the expert panel uh, listed. And then um, just in case you're not on um, the Marman listserv, the, the um, Pew uh, Foundation, their Lindfest Ocean Program is um, hosting two uh, uh, webinars coming up. The first one on, I think, March 10th is from the Ocean Modeling Forum, which does have a lot of the uh, heavy hitters from the IWC Scientific Committee who are uh, familiar with modeling uh, the whole bycatch uh, uh, issue. And, um, and then the second one, I think is March 24th, is, uh, uh, a, is a webinar about a system that was developed by Dr. Ellen Hines in San Francisco for use in countries with, um, without a lot of resources. Uh, it it uh, depends a lot on fishermen questionnaires and things like that. You might find those, those uh, webinars uh, interesting. And I think that's, it. So I will stop sharing my screen and a uh, answer any questions. Um, if there's still anybody on here, let's see. Uh, or if I haven't put you all to sleep. Uh, no, that's great. Thanks, Dave. Uh, are there any questions for Dave? You can yeah. unmute yourself or just type in the chat. It's Aaron Burke. Hi, Aaron. Oh, hey. Hi, how's it going? <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, and I was also um, interested to see you um, mention aquaculture because that was what my question was about. Um, <clears throat> in my experience with dealing with aquaculture and protected species in the Northeast, I feel like the, the managers don't quite um, take 
as much of the risk in the account as I think they should, especially about the horizontal line and a bunch of the proponents of aquaculture. I've heard a number of them say that, oh, the gear is so tense that the animals will just like bounce right off of it. And there's been so little research into like putting tensometers on the gear. Or, you know, there's not like a suite of gear modifications like we have for trap pot gear that could be employed. And so I was just curious what your opinion is on what the outcome might be because sometimes with aquaculture I feel like I'm just like screaming into the wind and everyone no one you know seems to like think it's a huge well, risk. Well um, a couple things on that it, it is uh, uh, of concern um, but a lot there's not a, not a lot of hard data um, there have been in uh, well, like I said this morning, I was been dealing with um, entang uh, folks who have some idea of entanglements in muscle farm gear, which are, you know, just dangling down. Um, and uh, it turned out, I think um, John Edwards on the west coast of Australia had at least eight entanglements that he was aware of. Um, I know in New Zealand, they've had several in muscle farm gear. And this, the request was from South Africa because it was an entanglement in, um, a bad entanglement in muscle farm. They, they, weren't able to get it out and they went out the next day to try to keep finish and it was it had a drowned. But, um, uh, you know, a lot of it, I think it's, at least my take on it is a lot of the aqua farming has start, started in very protected, you know, very near shore waters, which were, you know, unlikely, they're more likely to have problems with seals or maybe some small cetaceans, but as they move, as they expand and move out, uh, into deeper waters, they're, they are going to be, they are running into um, uh, large whales. And, and in fact, um, uh, the guy from Chile who runs the disentanglement there, he's, he's working um, quite feverishly with the salmon. They have a lot of aquaculture in Chile with the, uh, both the salmon farms and they, they have some mussel farms. But I, um, there was a review that um, I think Kemper at all did in 2003, but it's that's pretty that's probably pretty out of date by now. Um, I could forward that to you if you're interested, and or if you haven't seen it. And I, you might also contact um, Ed Lyman out in Hawaii. I know he and I both had to do some um, try to do the research on that. There were proposals for aquaculture in Hawaii, and um, yeah, the the whole business about. Uh, Oh, well, it's so, so the line's so tight, it, it won't be a problem, or the net's so tight, it won't be a problem. But, you know, uh, th then just this past summer, we had a fin whale uh, get entangled in a, um, a navigational buoy with a, with a chain. You know, it was, that was pretty, up in the Bay of Fundy, which was pretty tight, you know. But, um, uh, so it's, yeah, it's not, uh, but, but there's, there are not a lot of, uh, not a lot of data to be able to, to, to make a, a definitive statement, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. We had applied for a BREP grant to put tensometers on some kelp arrays, but it wasn't awarded. But, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done, I think, on that and of just getting the baseline data of like, all right, what tensions are we actually talking about here and what might the outcome be based on species? But thank you. Well, you could, you know, Mo Brown, you could talk to her up in, in Campobello where that, that's where that um, the fin whale hit the, hit the, the navigational buoy. Um, but uh, yeah, well, we can talk offline about that if you're interested, or, or I definitely would also talk with Ed. He, he, did, uh, he did some of the, those tensiometers or whatever. And uh, well, I, I noticed I have a, a, a question in the um, chat um, about Portugal. Um, and actually I've done um, entanglement training for, the, on, on the coast of Europe, there, there's a lot of fishing but there's, there actually are still not a lot of whales. Um, they haven't really come back. So they're not, they don't have as, they don't um, get as many reports. So there haven't been requests. I've been talking with the French government about it. Um, mostly I get requests from French territories in the um, uh, South Pacific and in Indian Ocean. But, um, you know, that it's, usually it doesn't, usually the reasons a country would request it is, one, if, if, if there are just a lot of reports coming in and they go, we got to do something. Two is, and this is something I haven't mentioned, but if, um, if they're uh, wondering what to do about the US Marine Mammal Protection Act import um, provision, um, they wonder, well, you know, sh should we be 
uh, develop in a disentanglement network to be able, because that's what the U.S. has in some places, uh, would that, you know, how would that help us to uh, ensure that they could keep um, uh, importing fish? Um, so there's, uh, but in the in Mediterranean and um, and uh, the Atlantic coast of, of Europe, until you get up to um, uh, northern UK and Scotland and then up to Norway, um, there are not a lot of reports. It's sporadic enough. Uh, the unfortunate thing in some places, especially tropical places, if it's sporadic, uh, people tend to go crazy and do do dangerous things uh, trying to release whales. So um, that's another reason we would, you know, uh, I'm considering doing some of these trainings in the in Oceania because they don't get many reports, but when they do, boy, people, you know, they're the water's warm and clear, so their immediate instinct is to jump in the water, which is not not a safe thing to do. I don't know if that answered the question about Portugal, but we, um, yeah, we haven't. We did have had a request from Italy and Spain. And like I said, I'm in, uh, but that happened right before the pandemic. And um, uh, we, there's a chance that we might uh, do that as a regional training under the ACABAMS agreement, which is a convention of migratory uh, species agreement between I think 26 countries in the Mediterranean. Um, although I guess Portugal is not, I don't think they're a signature because they're they're on the Atlantic. Anyway, sorry. Any other questions? Other questions for Dan? Hearing none, um, I'd like to thank. Dave for taking time out from his day to give us this uh, great lecture. I appreciate your, uh, whoops, here we go. Uh, we got one question. What is the distinct range of Southern Atlantic right whales? Um, I'm, I don't know if I know exactly what you mean by that, except um, they obviously do not, um, most of the, both the Northern and Southern right whales don't migrate very far towards the equator. So there's no overlap and they are distinct so subspecies, but um, they are, um, oh, maybe this is in relation to the question about uh, Chile. Um, they are found uh, circumpolar. So I believe that there are Southern right whales off of uh, South Africa, off of um, um, Australia, um, off of South America. Uh, the, from what I understand, the population of Chile it's been shown to be genetically distinct enough, and there's, I, I believe there's only 30 um, reproductive females estimated. Um, now, you know what, I, I think that, I, I, that is up to probably each, each, each country to decide or, or, or collectively decide, well, what type of uh, population segment is important not to let it uh, evaporate. Uh, disappear. And uh, actually in the US, um, we do um, evaluate as a distinct population segments. Are they, um, and there's, there, um, I, I was on the review for humpbacks and, and there was a, there's documentation about what the, what the US considers criteria for a distinct population segment. It's not, you know, it's not like you can just plug in the numbers and come out with, you know, with a, yeah, uh, yeah, this one definitely is, but it's, you know, are they, uh, uh, morphologically distinctive? Could you tell high percentage of them apart? Are they genetically distinctive? Do they have um, unique behaviors or, or, um, uh, or yeah, un unique behaviors or, or fill a unique um, role in the ecosystem compared to their, their close relatives? Then they might, would, would be considered a di distinct population segment. Uh, I mean, I was interested, I think what, on that last one, for instance, if I think if, it, if a population of humpbacks had a different song than another population, they might be considered, that would be factored in. Or um, if they, they use a partic particular type of feeding strategy at, on a particular prey that others don't, you know, that might be factored into whether they're distinct. Um, I'm not sure that's what you're getting at, but the, um, I think it, in the Southern hemisphere with Southern right whales, it's mostly based on genetics. Any more questions? Well, seeing none, I want to thank Dave again. <laughs> yeah.
for taking time out of this day. Uh, we appreciate appreciate it. Um, and for next next, let's see, the next talk is March fifteenth, and I have a woman named Sarah Perez from the New England Aquarium's uh, Marine Animal Rescue Team. She's going to be talking about uh, sea turtle strandings uh, in Massachusetts. So. Um, if anyone wants to, uh, who, who's not on the um, distribution list, email distribution list, if you want to be on it, uh, send me uh, an email um, and I'll put you on it. So thanks again, Dave. We appreciate right. it. Uh, good talk. Appreciate the, the invitation. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care.